1. Our group had just finished a homebrew 1 to 20 campaign. We used D&D Beyond for the entirety of our campaign. With the DM paying for the top subscription so the source books and rules would be readily available for all players to reference. And we could easily click things on our sheet to learn more about it. This was so useful because we were all new to the game. I spent a lot of time reading through the content and learning how to play, even found some cheat sheets and compared them with the party. However, it seemed the other players did not read the rule book and barely read their character sheets. The DM and I often stepped in to try and help them, but were often waved off with something along the lines of, Where would I read about that? This is just to give some background, but playing the campaign with them was a horror story on its own. To help scratch the itch of not having any more D&D, the DM and I were playing around with different builds, creating characters on D&D Beyond with the DM shared content for fun and theory crafting. One of the players came into the voice chat and asked what we were doing as we're laughing over silly builds we've made. We explain and the player starts mocking us, calling us nerds because we care about the rules of the game for some reason. Said player then offered to DM a game for us if we didn't care about the rules because the rules don't make sense anyway, and said the last game they DM'd for was fun. This was curious because this player was notorious for not knowing the rules or even what was going on during the campaign, so I asked for an example of what they meant with the rules. They pointed to their campaign character as an example, who happened to be a monk and sorcerer multiclass, my monk could be really strong, but stunning strike rarely worked because the monk's save DC is too low. The DM and I start explaining that save DC isn't fixed per class, but increases if you put more points in the ACI associated with it. That's dumb. It should just increase as you level. Well, good news it does, as save DC is a combination of ASI modifiers and your proficiency bonus which increases as you level. Unfortunately, we explained, you only had a plus two in wisdom, which is what powered your stunning strike save DC. You took feats instead of increasing your ASI. Uh, I didn't know it worked like that. For reference, it had been mentioned several times during the campaign how save DC worked, and why ASI was sometimes better to take than feats usually when a player was complaining about how low their save DC was. The player immediately jumped to their next point. Well, my sorcerer's spells were also really weak. Take the sleep spell, for example. It was really good at low levels, but it was useless in the end of the campaign against the higher level enemies. I pointed out to them that you're meant to upcast to increase its power, but because they multi-classed into monk, they had max third level spell slots for their sorcerer at character level 15. I shouldn't have to upcast it. My spell should just get stronger without needing to cast higher spell slots. So you want to cast spells with 8th level power with only 5 levels in sorcerer? No thanks. I only said that sounded really unbalanced and went back to theory crafting. I don't think I'll be taking them up on their offer to DM. 2. So, this is a strange horror story, even for my standards. Time ago, I was on Discord during the pandemic, and I was discussing certain games with the people in chat, to which one particular individual, whom we will call Kenneth, for obvious reasons, is in the conversation listening carefully. This server was focused on TTRPGs, but most people only did D&D &D because that was the only thing they knew, and I have a reputation for being the drug dealer of games. I'm the shady guy who goes, Psst, hey, wanna play some Vampire the Masquerade? The cool kids play Vampire the Masquerade type of guy. Thing is, I am describing Exalted. Some of you may go, oh boy, the moment I said that name. For those who don't know what Exalted is, I'll try to summarize as this. Think Avatar The Last Airbender or Korra plus Final Fantasy 3 and 4 and a bit of 7, Add Ghibli's Mononoke, Nausicaa, Laputa, and a bit of Macross Plus, and a bit of Evangelion, 
a lot of 90s martial arts anime, and you're halfway there. It's a high-fantasy TTRPG that tries to emulate the drama and combat of anime, with all the style and rule of cool you can squeeze into a book. That being said, the book has its flaws, but that's not why we are here. So I had a few people interested. Among them, we had Kenneth. As I was explaining the backstory of the game, I went into the myth of creation. When, when Saul Invictus gave his powers to exalt individuals to bear his power, and how the solar exalted were gods among gods, to which Kenneth goes, Excuse me, what? Oh yeah, I said, exalted has a rich mythology, where there's a god for everything. It's very close to animism in theory. And what? said Kenneth. Animism, you know, a religious belief in which everything, every object, and every being in nature has a corresponding god. The god of rivers, the god of winds, the god of harvest, the god of the blade, the god of hammers, etc. I don't get it, said Kenneth, to which everyone was silent, and I said it's kind of common in anime. Yes, but I still don't get it, I mean. It can be possible in Japan, but in Christianity there's only one god, and believing there's more than one is heresy. I couldn't believe it. The guy couldn't separate his personal perspectives from a game or even expand his personal horizons to consider that possibility. I don't like it, it sounds satanic. He said, to which one of the players said, How can that be satanic? Well, again, the belief of other gods beyond THE God and Jesus is kind of disrespectful. Another player in the chat interjected, But don't you run D&D? &D? Isn't there, like, huge pantheons of gods? Kenneth said, What's a pantheon? You know, different gods with their own systems of belief. To which Kenneth replied, one of the things that to this day made me speechless. Yeah, but in my D&D &D games I don't use other gods. I made Jesus in D&D, &D, and God. And then there's Satan. It's very easy to understand, and it follows the Christian values. One of the players said, What if I'm Jewish and I don't believe in Christ? To which Kenneth just nonchalantly said, I won't let you join my games as simple as that. After that, I had to take five. Time passed and I ended up running exalted for a bit to a few of the players. We had fun. And I'm glad Kenneth didn't join the game. But I'm still baffled that he was so... Zealot? Three. Now, our online friend group has been around for over six years now me being one of the more recent additions. DM and Pokey had known each other the second longest as far as I know, and close enough to lend large sums of money to each other, and even planned on sharing a place. DM had wanted to run a Fantasy Meets Dinosaurs themed campaign through Discord, and Roll20 had invited me, Blunderbuss, Pokey, and four others. We were given a choice of three homebrew races all three of which hate each other for various reasons, and through the will of the gods of the setting must work together to rid the land of dinosaurs of a rising evil and all of that jazz. For the first two or three sessions, before DM would have to put the campaign on hold for a few months, everything went fine, albeit with a few hiccups as some of us have never played D&D &D before. Once the whole IRL fiasco the DM had to deal with was over, that was early as I can tell when things started taking a turn for the worst. We were given a quest by a merchant wizard to commandeer a ship from Pyrus and escort him to the mainland. The wizard did not like us one bit. Pokey and another player were trying to chum up with the guy, the former which going as far as to ignore the fight going on because he only decided to sleep through the beginning but spent much of the rest trying to make friends with said wizard. Other occurrences of problems caused by him were of typical problem guy scenarios, ignoring party agreed decisions going off on his own, arguing with the DM over whether or not protective field would work on the ship. The party was fighting what was basically a megalodon. There was a moment where the party was trying to decide who should be party leader and Pokey decided to change the topic for introducing one of his ideas. The idea itself I personally had no issues with, just wasn't the appropriate time. It wouldn't be for a couple of weeks later that we learned that Pokey has been shit-talking about us behind our backs 
While still asking if we have another session. At this point, the DM had enough. And after a one-on-one -on -one chat had to remove him from the campaign, his response, I'd rather slam my balls with honey and crush symbols in a cave of sleeping wolverines than do anything with that cesspit of a group you've created. <laughs> Pokey later claimed that the only reason he stuck around was because he is getting material for a D&D horror story about the campaign. Before I learned of what he did, I honestly felt sorry for the guy as months earlier. He had been kicked from the house he and his sister shared, and was forced to move across the states to live in an acquaintance's apartment. He didn't have a car either, so DM was generous enough to not only buy him a bike, but also a moped the latter which he ended up wrecking. Before Pokey was able to move in with other relatives, he decided to trash the acquaintance's apartment before leaving. Worse he has done was spilling DM's personal secrets to Blunderbuss, which convinced him to leave the group. All in all, he claimed that we were nothing but a toxic bunch, and that he is feeling all the better having left. 4. I had a GM that I put up with for way too long. Aside from just being generally gross, and very much of the female characters must wear a chainmail bikini ilk, he was also kind of racist. There was the basic, some races are just evil rhetoric, to him straight up starting an argument over real life racial issues. One argument solidified my decision to avoid him as much as I could. He still DM'd my ex's weekly game at our house, in which he tried to convince the other players to pimp out my male character on more than one occasion. It was awful. We'll call him Greg. So Greg had asked me to join a VTM game he was running. I had played in a VTM game he was running at an open table at a local spot. I liked the game and wanted to play some more. I was asked to be a character who could corral the other PCs who were all playing freshly made vampires that were off the rails. I was brought in with the husband of another player, Jake, to be the older vampires that were there to basically babysit the unruly table. We had a short session to introduce the babysitter characters to a few of the other PCs. My character was like a vampire cop slash lawyer, who was there because they pissed off the prince and she was going to turn the next idiot to step out of line into Ash. She was pretty awesome, but I didn't get to play her long. Jake's character was ancient, rich, and needed help finding some long-lost relic of his bloodline. He was a former gladiator in Rome, and had many skills and refined judgment that comes with centuries of discipline. Greg loved all of it, but decided that there was no way that Jake could have been a gladiator, because there were no black gladiators. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, Jake is black. Greg very proudly spouted this absolute gem, and we all laughed. That's about as silly as declaring that French fries are all from France. He looked mad and asked what was so funny. I told him, straight up, of course there were black gladiators. He held firm, and men explained to me that there could not have been any black gladiators, because ancient Romans were all white. Another PC, who if I'm remembering correctly was studying to be a historian at the time, told him that the Roman Empire encompassed basically the entire Mediterranean Sea, the southern shores of it being on the northern edge of fucking Africa. There were black Romans, there were black gladiators, hell, there were even black emperors. Or at least African ones. Greg did not like that I disagreed with his proclamation. He scoffed, saying, if there were black people in ancient Rome, why aren't there any books or paintings? The table responded with variations of historians be racist, giving examples of white historians erasing or diminishing the impact of non-white advancements in science, mathematics, medicine, and the arts. Jake was interested in looking up some of the names and events we were discussing. Greg was pissed. Thoroughly lambasted, Greg threatened to end the game if we didn't stop lecturing him about history. The table all silently agreed to make a point of bringing up Jake's gladiatorness whenever possible. It was a decent time, and I went back a couple times, until the game went super off the rails. 
something something Labyrinth under Berlin, something something in the cast of Critical Roller there, and their fate? Nah. Let old Rona gave me more of a solid excuse to stop having him invite Greg over. Five. A few years ago, I joined a D&D Discord community with a rather interesting concept, where people would make a character, get it verified by an admin, and then you look out on the DM notice board, where you sign up and then do your adventure with a bunch of people and gradually level up over time. I had done a few adventures prior and had a really good time, made some friends and had a good few sessions. I was still very new to D&D at the time and I wasn't yet savvy with local groups, etc. This takes place as my Dragonborn War Cleric hit level 2 and me and a few other players take up a job to investigate a goblin cave that is harassing a local village. The first thing I noticed about the DM was that he was very short-tempered and didn't have patience with the more new players and tried to hurry the group along with the decisions. Eventually, after a rather rushed introduction, we reached the goblin cave, which to our surprise was crudely fortified, so we all huddled up and tried to decide on how best to go about it. This went on for about 10 minutes before a voice in chat cut in, Ray, I'm going to the store and we'll be listening in. If you all don't have a plan by the time we get back, I'll end this session and find another group who will. And on his word, the DM muted himself. Needless to say, the tension and awkwardness we all felt was really bad. So under pressure, me and the new guys came up with a crude plan and thought, screw it. And here we go. As we mainly expected, it was a trap. Luckily, due to me having a shield, as well as the other fighter and the speed of the monk, we managed to get through it. Eventually, we came upon this grand opening in the cave, where the goblins had this sort of altar guarded by these weird beasts. And so the combat ensued. We handled it pretty well. However, things turned a bit sour when I was one-on-one with one of these beasts. Those who know War Clerics, we have the ability War Priest, which lets us use, up to our Wisdom mod, our bonus action as an extra attack. How the fuck are you doing that? He shouted. I calmly explained. Though this didn't seem to pacify him, and he went as far as to get an admin in the game to confirm what I was saying. Following this, he asked the staff to stay to keep an eye on me. I shrugged it off and we got to the end of the dungeon, where we began to investigate the altar. To which this angel-like figure ascended to faces and told us to forgive the wrongdoings of others in order for us to truly be enlightened. What? With everyone confused, I decided to inquire and ask that with my acolyte background and time spent in temples, would I know who this angel represents? His response was as follows. Buddy, this ain't critical role. I don't know what you mean. I'm just saying to ask if my character's knowledge, after spending time in temples and such, would I know what deity they represent? Look, you would have zero idea about this, so stop asking and just listen. This isn't critical role. That was it. I just sat quietly and let him finish his huge-ass monologue about morals before the session ended. Usually you stay behind and offer comments for the DMs, but I just left. I felt so put down by the encounter that I just left the server. Luckily, I never gave up with D&D and have found far better people and had far better experiences. Glad I didn't give up, but holy crap, that's a real trial by fire. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 20 Sided Dance, RPG Stories, Episode 1. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Uh, before you go, if you could please check you have enough hit points and then hit the like button. Okay, let's see. I think we actually have a birthday shout-out today, don't we? Yes, we do. And today's birthday shout-out goes to Sherilyn. I don't know how old Sherilyn is today, but today is her birthday. So, make sure you're taking... Well, taking all of November, really, because October is almost over. Make sure you celebrate and treat yourself, Sherilyn. When I do all the things you love to do. Space them out a bit, because, you know, that's over a month. All right, now, before I go, I'd like to sing happy birthday. At least I'll do my best. Uh, and uh, then we'll have Hellfreezer's question of the day. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sherilyn. Happy birthday to you. All righty. Let's see. Let's move right along to Halfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... As this is the inaugural RPG Horror Stories based uh, video, what's your favorite role playing game? I personally don't play them, it's not my cup of tea, but uh, I have many people in the community that do, I know, because I hear you talk. So let me know what your favorites are. Maybe leave a, a brief explanation of what they're about in a comment below. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourself.